Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Decision Making Tools for the Boardroom. This is the second webinar in our two part series this spring. So, um, thanks so much for being here, and uh, we look forward to getting started. I, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Courtney Berner. I am the Executive Director of the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives. So before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, our webinar today will be about one hour. And as you might have noticed, your lines are muted and they will be muted for the duration of the webinar. Um, the format for our presentation today will be presentation by my colleague, Kelly Maynard, followed by live question and answers. Um, and you can submit your questions in the Q&A box. So we have both a chat and a Q&A box. You're welcome to chat with um, fellow attendees during the um, session. But if you have a question for our presenter, please put that in the Q&A box. I know that some of you also submitted questions as part of the registration process, and we'll do our best to get to some of those as well. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the UWCC website within a couple days of this presentation. All right. So a little bit about the UW Center for Cooperatives. Um, we are based at UW-Madison, however, we serve the entire state of Wisconsin. We began these uh, director forums, these sort of governance trainings, peer-based governance, governance trainings back in 2015 and did them in person for many years and we switched to an online format um, when coronavirus emerged. So the center itself was founded in 1962 and we do a mix of research, outreach and education on the cooperative business model. Today, um, we are lucky to have the presenter, Kelly Maynard. She's a colleague of mine at the center. She's a cooperative development specialist, and um, she focuses her work on supporting food and agricultural enterprises in rural communities. Uh, she enjoys working with diverse groups as they refine their cooperative business proposition, and she really prioritizes facilitation and learning about group process and governance in the early stages of cooperative development. So with that, I will turn um, the presentation over to Kelly. I'm gonna turn your video on, Kel. Hello, everybody. And it's just a reminder that as things come up for you in the presentation, please uh, put them in the Q&A box and we will address as many as we can. So real quick, we're gonna figure out, um, get a sense of who is in the room. So I am going to launch a poll. Um, just what sector best describes your cooperative? Take um, 30 seconds or so to answer this. Hopefully you see it on your screen. One thing we really love about these um, directors forums is that we get a, a range of directors and other folks from co-ops, all ownership types and sectors. So we'll take a few more Seconds. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna end this first poll. Looks like we've got a lot of grocery folks in the room, some manufacturing, ag. Um, so this is very exciting. Now, oh. Folks, I'm gonna relaunch the poll in case folks <clears throat> didn't answer the second question. Um, when your board makes a decision, what processes and tools are usually used? You can feel free to answer that again. All right, a few more seconds. So I'll show again, <clears throat> a lot of uh, open discussion in voting, some folks using consensus processes, some other. So thank you for sharing. We're gonna um, talk about all of those things and others in the webinar today. 
Can you go to the next slide, Courtney? All right. So these are all uh, words, right? Um, that we're likely familiar with. These are the, the words most commonly used, the tools most commonly used um, when our boards make decisions. Um, today, I'm gonna offer some additional tools um, and talk about um, different situations that illustrate um, when and how you might best use them. <clears throat> so again, these words describe um, the, the kind of tools or rules and processes that we most often apply. Next slide. These um, are some sentiments or complaints um, that we really commonly hear. And you maybe have said or felt yourself <laughs> while uh, making a decision with a group or sitting around the board table. These really get at the way that we feel about how the processes and tools are used. Um, and these are the feelings that can get in the way, uh, right, of the board making its best decisions or making the best use of all the knowledge and experience of the directors around the table. Um, and these feelings accumulated over time can, can lead to a really counterproductive board culture. So our goal today is to add some tools in that get us away from having some of these feelings. And I would urge you to notice that a lot of these are not about the decision itself, right? They're really all about the inter interpersonal dynamics um, and how we are all made to feel when working as a collective, making a decision. One thing that I do wanna point out before we move forward with some of the tools is that all of these tools um, that we'll discuss today assume that the directors have the information that they need in order to make a decision. Um, if you need some tools and ideas about um, things related to the information needed and um, meeting process to, um, before decisions are being made, um, I would definitely refer you to some of our webinars from last um, spring that are available for free on our website. Next slide. So again, these are those, those words from the first slide, but divided into two categories, right? Um, we tend to lump the components of decision-making together, but today we're gonna pull them apart and talk about process tools um, and then closure tools. We um, hear the word consensus a lot. Um, and some, some people say, um, you know, our, our board uses consensus to make decisions. The word consensus literally means to think and feel together, right? And so it is, the, is a process tool um, as, as opposed to a closure tool. And I would argue that most boards are using a consensus process, right? They're sharing their thoughts, they're sharing their feelings, and then using some sort of closure tool when it's time to make a decision. The importance or nature of the decision can really impact both the process tools that we use and the closure tools that we use. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. Next slide. So for process, the first thing I'd like to talk about, um, it's very simple, um, it's just reflect and then share. And the idea is that <clears throat> instead of posing a question or asking for feedback on a proposal and immediately launching into an open kind of discussion, that we take a moment of silence and let people collect their thoughts either in writing or just in their heads before anyone speaks. We really all benefit from having a moment to pause and reflect and maybe write before responding to a question. And there are those of us, myself included, who really need it in order to make um, our best contributions. Adding that short time for reflection 
um, helps put people on an even playing field um, and can lead to some more equal participation in a group, especially if you have some of those dynamics where there's people who always speak and then people who don't as much. Um, <clears throat> think pair share is, is a similar idea. It can be appropriate um, for a really complicated question or discussion. And the idea here is that instead of moving directly from reflection to sharing with the full group, that the participants maybe pair off and share some initial thoughts with one other person before reporting back to the full group. Now, of course, something like this is pretty hard um, right now when we're all meeting virtually, but once we're meeting in person again, um, I do encourage you to try think, pair, share. Now, <clears throat> um, a lot of folks will say, oh my gosh, our board meetings are already so full. How do we create time for this? Um, this moment of reflection can really be 30 seconds to a minute. It does not need to be a long period of time. And it would be part of the overall time allotted um, to the discussion or for an agenda item. <clears throat> now, once there's been that pause, um, you can open up, how do you open up the floor, right? As the board chair or, or facilitator at the meeting. I think we're all probably guilty of defaulting to, to what we call popcorn style, right? Whoever, whoever speaks first, speaks first, whoever speaks next, speaks next, and it kind of goes from there. Um, <clears throat> and it can be really useful to think about how this is um, maybe good for your group or can hinder um, the, dy the dynamic in your group. So round robin is a way to just literally go around the table, right? Everyone gets a little bit of time to say what they need to say. And maybe you do it more than once. Um, you can also combine these things. You can do round robin so that every, so everyone gets to say something and then follow up with some popcorn if there's, if there's final comments. The criteria matrix idea um, can be really helpful um, in, a, in a number of scenarios, particularly if you are trying to weigh a few options against each other and there's kind of some pre-established criteria or priorities. Also, if you are really trying to come to agreement about the importance of the decision. Next slide. So these are just some examples of what a criteria um, matrix looks like. <clears throat> now, this would be, this would not be how you would make the decision itself. Right? This is how, as individuals, we would kind of gain some more data points about how options stack up against one another. Um, a little bit later on, I'll be talking about determining decision importance. And these different, the different criteria for decision importance could go in a matrix like this. Um, so you have a sense of, again, because not, again, not all decisions warrant um, this level of process. So next slide. So <clears throat> people have had a moment to reflect. Everyone has, had, has been able to share. Um, some potentially some proposals have been compared. At some point, there's a little bit of a hurdle to get over between process and closure. And these are some ideas that help with that. Um, I would not recommend springing these on your group in the middle of an actual decision, right? But maybe you have a conversation about which of these rule or rules might be most um, a best fit for your group, kind of allowable in your group. group. And they could even be written down um, in board policy. Things like having a time-limited extension that can just kind of be the call of the board chair or facilitator realizing, you know what, we, we need to table this decision, maybe we need inf more information so it goes to a committee. But things like uh, someone calling for closure and a few others agreeing, if, that, if you want that to be a, a procedure that the group can use to end discussion, um, 
everyone should be aware that that is something that they can do and maybe that is captured in board policy. Next slide. <clears throat> so our closure tools. Once um, different proposals have maybe been evaluated, people have been able to share their thoughts, People have agreed, okay, I think we're, we're more or less at closure. Um, this, these are the ways you can work through that, some ways you can work through that. And again, the importance of the decision really may influence which of these that you use. The first thing might seem hardly like a tool at all, um, but I would argue that it is really important. And that is just to make sure that the full proposal or decision statement is written down and visible to everyone. If you are working through some, you know, a complicated proposal or multiple proposals have been discussed over the course of the conversation, it can be easy to be confused, right? You often, it's very common at a point of a vote for someone to say, wait, are we, which budget number are we talking about? Which, which provision are we talking about, right? <clears throat> so writing it down, making it visible, and this is easy to do in person or virtually. Um, now, before you head to that vote, you can use something called gradients of agree agreement. Um, and we use this tool because our standard decision-making rules do not do a good job of reflecting the nuances of how people actually feel. If you think back um, to the, that slide about the, the feelings we often have around or can have around decisions, I don't feel heard, I, I know I'm in the minority, so what does my opinion matter, right? Most of us do not think in black and white terms or yes or no terms. Um, and when we move immediately from discussing an issue to taking an up and or down vote, we force people to pick a side without acknowledging the complexity of their feelings around it. So <clears throat> this tool allows us to get a handle on that. Um, now vote, right? This is something that voting is something that boards are doing all the time, usually multiple times a meeting. I would urge you to consider that there are a lot of ways to go about a vote. Um, <clears throat> a, lot of, a lot of boards, simple majority is the decision-making rule, right? Um, you might have an, another agreed upon percentage, some you know, two thirds, some sort of super majority. Oftentimes in your bylaws and maybe in policies, there'll be certain types of decisions um, that require more than just a majority vote make sure that those are specified. Um, a lot of groups that, that talk um, about consensus, reaching consensus or using consensus process, right? Ultimately what their goal is to have unanimity, but a lot of them um, have a unanimity minus one kind of vote rule, right? So that there's not just one person um, who can hold everything up. So we're gonna spend a little bit more time um, talking about how to use gradients of agreement. Next slide. So this is one example of a gradients of agreement scale. It comes from um, a book called Facil The Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision-Making by Sam Kaner. There are lots of examples of gradients of agreement out there um, in the follow-up email to today. There will be some other examples that aren't quite as many numbers quite as granular as one through eight. But you'll see here <clears throat> that this reflects a greater uh, range of the actual feelings we often have when we're placed um, in the role of making a decision, right? Maybe, you, maybe it was your proposal and you wholeheartedly endorse it, right? Maybe um, you have a few reservations, but you support it. Maybe you feel like there's a little more discussion needed or 
you know, you don't ultimately, you don't like it, but you're not going to block it. You know, you'll support it if that's the, the decision the group makes. All the way to, you know, I have really, really serious reservations about this proposal, or I would, I would really try to block this proposal, right? So this is way more than, than an up or down vote, yes or no. So what do you do with this range of feelings? Next slide. So <clears throat> once the group has used its, its process tools, right? And you, you're at this point of closure, clearly state that proposal, um, right? The thing that will ultimately be voted on and make sure it's visible. Do a quick check for understanding of that proposal. You can maybe make some, do some little bit of wordsmithing as long as it doesn't change the meaning. And then you get out your scorecard. That's this, this gradients scale. In the same way that you want to make sure that the proposal is visible to everyone, um, introducing this, this gradients of agreement tool is probably not something you would do in the middle of a big decision. You would want everyone to have seen the scorecard, the gradients scale first, probably have a copy of it, you know, maybe in their, in their board binder or with their, with their agenda and have it visible, right? So folks know, um, you know, the numbers mean these things. And this is how I express uh, my number or my feeling. So you have that scorecard that's visible with the gradients defined. And then the board chair, um, or facilitator can just ask the group, where do you stand on this proposal right now? This is not the vote, right? This is getting a sense of where people are before the vote occurs. <clears throat> you capture where people are along the gradients, and then everyone can take a moment <laughs> to take stock, right? Um, one of you will, in the, um, follow up email today to today with some resources there are, you know if it feels complicated to have scorecards and and numbers and remember all of these things you can really simplify this um, there are people who use thumbs systems so thumbs up I'm, I'm generally feeling okay with it thumbs in the middle I you know maybe I'm I'm so so maybe I, I need some questions answered still thumbs down I'm you know really um, not on line with this proposal. You can use different colored um, little index cards, green, yellow, and red, right? There's a lot of ways to do this that are not an, um, a scale of one to eight. Next slide. So people have expressed where they feel on, on this on a scale. The role, certainly the role of the board chair um, or the facilitator is to have a sense of, well, what level of support are you looking for or do you need, right? If your um, closure rule is a simple majority, um, this gradients of agreement vote will give you a sense of where the group stands. Um, if you need a super majority, based on the type of the decision, um, again, you'll have a sense of whether you're there or not. Um, <clears throat> the importance of the decision, the, the, the duration of the impact of the decision, um, the cost of the decision, right? All of these can impact how much support you really feel like you want or need. Um, when it comes down to the vote. Next slide. So here's an example, right? Where after using the gradients of agreement, it's clear this group is ready to go to a vote and the proposal is going to pass. You know, maybe that abstention, you know, the abstention could go one way or the other, right? But this, this group is in, is, is in a good place in terms of being able to reach closure. Next slide. Ambiguous support, right? 
you've got a spread of people, you know. In this case, if simple majority is your decision-making rule, you have it, right? This board of seven, you've got four who are in some amount of support, and you've got three who are, you know, not feeling it as much, right? Maybe, and so <clears throat> as the board chair, as the facilitator, this is where you have some flexibility to decide what to do next, right? For the folks who said, you know, I, you know, maybe I'm a five or a six, you could ask for them from them, you know, is there some, is, do you need something in particular to feel better about this proposal? Is there something that might move you towards the, the left, towards three or four, right? And there could be a set time window for reflection and sharing around that very specific question. Next slide. Again, this is not a majority support, right? With a few outliers. This is also not an uncommon scenario. Again, in a board, in a board where a majority rules, even if you needed a supermajority, right? This proposal will pass, but you may really want to hear um, from the directors who said, who said they're feeling like they don't like it, but they'll support it or they have serious disagreement. You might really, really wanna hear from them. Um, what might move them to the left? Do they absolutely have to agree on the proposal? Maybe not, right? But this gives them a chance to share one more time. Next slide. So, <clears throat> What are some options to try? I would argue that the um, assessing the decision importance, right? What, um, what is the potential impact? What is the potential cost? What um, is the level of buy-in you really need for it to something to be implemented effectively? That could be done as a group exercise first. That could be something that is done through using the criteria matrix, right? And people first reach agreement about how much agreement they need on the ultimate proposal. That can feel like maybe a lot of process. I would not suggest that that is something that has to be used every time, but on a really big decision or a decision that feels particularly contentious or where you are aware there may be some strong decision um, opinions, making sure people are on the same page about how important and the nature of the importance can be a really important first step. Again, <clears throat> there's this clear statement of a proposal. This, and you give a group a moment to reflect quietly. You can do <clears throat> one round robin and then follow up with popcorn. And that whole thing still took about 20 minutes. A lot of times in our, in our board agendas, that's about as much time as we allot to decisions anyways. And this just helped break it up and change the dynamics. Um, in the room or over the Zoom. With practice, using the gradients of agreement can just take a minute or two. It does not some, need to be something that takes a really long amount of time. And then based on the results of the gradients of agreement, maybe you move to a vote. One thing um, that I would like to point out <clears throat> about the voting in both of these, in any scenario, is that there may be um, situations, really contentious decisions where you know that there are a lot of feelings in the room, a lot of different ideas and feelings are, have been expressed over the course of the, over the discussion, the process, and even through the gradients of agreement. 
it is completely okay and sometimes a very good idea to do a blind vote at the end. The numbers will still be recorded, but people feel sometimes more able to vote the way that they need to vote without ending up being attacked later on. <clears throat> so I want to go um, back up. Courtney, sorry, can you go back up to the beginning slides? The second slide with the feelings. Oh, no. Slide number eight. Slide number eight. Hmm. Apologize. I didn't show me the slide numbers on here. Sorry. It's okay. okay. Keep going. One, keep going. The one that shows the feelings about how we feel in the boardroom. Ah, there. That yeah. one? Great. So <clears throat> these feelings, right, that we have, that we all have when we're, when we're working in groups, trying to make a decision. These few loud people dominating the discussion. This is a scenario, right, where, this, where the quiet reflection can be really helpful and utilizing round robin in our process. Hopefully this feeling of not being heard can be addressed through some of those tools and also through using something like the gradients of agreement where the, your full, the full extent of your feelings about the proposal can be shared. This knowing you know, you're in the minority, so does your opinion even matter? Right? That's really where the gradients of agreement comes into play. Um, <clears throat> it allows everyone to see, maybe gives you a little extra time to voice some very particular concerns. Um, <clears throat> and ultimately, and have those recorded. And, you know, it gives, it, it helps validate that the, you're not just trying to be a stick in the mud or a difficult um, person holding up a decision. Um, this taking lots and lots of time, right? Talking in circles. This is where I would recommend that all of these tools be used with time limits, right? Not in an open-ended fashion. Um, <clears throat> And that you experiment with using different combinations of them, right? There's the tools are a little bit like the science, but the art is putting them together and implementing them. And that comes, you know, just with the knowledge of your group, um, the preferences of your group, and with time and practice. So I would, I would emphasize mixing and matching some of these tools and see how they fit together. <clears throat> Lastly, using things like the criteria matrix, right? Help put the proposals up against criteria that have nothing to do with not nothing to do with the people in the room, but who, that aren't personal criteria, right? If people often feel attacked um, or, or you, have the, you have the folks that try to personalize the decisions, the criteria matrix is a way to depersonalize um, and pull it away from any individual personalities and make it about the criteria that the co-op have established. So, um, I think my recommendations, can we go back down two slides to process tools? My recommendation would be to maybe spend a few minutes in a meeting talking about these tools and trying them out one by one. 
I wouldn't necessarily revamp your whole board meeting all at once with some of these tools. Something like the gradients of agreement tool, right, might take a little bit more introduction. In the resources today, um, there'll be a short video that's actually from Sam Kaner explaining gradients of agreement. You're welcome to share that with your boards. Go back down to the closure tools. One more. And I would have real clarity um, with your board about which particular closure tools are relevant for which decisions. Um, if you're really moving, if you really want to have more than a simple majority on most decisions, that should be spelled out somewhere um, so that people are aware that that and, and trying to use the processes that will get you there. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Hi everyone. So if you could, if you have questions, um, just put them in the Q&A section. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now so that Kelly and I are not itty bitty boxes on your screen. Um, so while I wait for folks to enter some questions in the Q&A, why don't I pitch one that came in through registration? So, um, talked a little bit about some of the different tools we can use in meetings and for decision making. How often should tools be you know, reevaluated or how might someone bring up that conversation with their board about um, you know, implementing potentially some new tools? Yeah, I think you know, if, you're, if you're part of an established co-op that has a way of doing things, it can feel hard to try to introduce something new. It could be as simple as, hey, I went to, I sat in on a webinar and they shared some ideas. Um, here's, here's the link to the, to the slides. If you, you, know, you could share that with a board chair. Um, I think trying one tool at a time and just seeing the impact can feel less threatening um, if, if, there's a, if there's a board that has kind of established way of doing things. Um, that's, that's a kind of a starting point. I would say, you know, try one, one small change and um, have everyone see, you know, how did that work? Um, you can always do a quick check-in at the end of a board meeting when something new was tried. Did we like that? Was that worth it? <laughs> would, we, would we adjust it in some way? How, how about, what do you think, Courtney? Yeah, no, I think those are all great recommendations. And sometimes, um, you know, it may not, <laughs> sometimes, um, so the last session we did for this uh, webinar series was about board evaluation. And I think if your board did a self-evaluation and some of those um, sentiments came up in the evaluation that Kelly shared on an earlier slide where people are maybe feeling a little frustrated by the dynamics in meetings, that's a great opportunity um, as a chair or as a, a member of the board to introduce um, the possibility of doing things a little differently. All right, so another question. Um, what are some good strategies to help boards sort of seek the truth and sort of just instead of just winning the debate? Um, it's one of those sometimes we talk about listening for understanding <laughs> rather than listening to respond. So any um, techniques or processes you might suggest, Kelly? I think what kind of what that gets me to um, is what you know what is the truth <laughs> that we're that, that we're seeking, and so I think that um, something like a criteria matrix, right? Can you know ultimately what you're trying to do is make a decision that helps the co-op and or membership in some way, and what and what are the criteria that allow you to know that that is happening, right? And so. Again, the criteria matrix doesn't actually make the decision, but it kind of stacks up a proposal against some of these criteria that can be like, these, this is, these are our true aims, right? <laughs> um, and having that in front of people helps kind of clarify um, without anyone speaking, 
you know, how a proposal stacks up. Um, <clears throat> I, do, I do think that um, something, like the, something like the gradients of agreement um, helps, helps people, um, I mean, it personalizes it, right? But it helps get at the root of, it can really help get at the root of what about a proposal um, has some people not saying yes, right? Um, and it's, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be um, an argument, um, an interpersonal argument. It, it gives, can give them the space to have the full feelings that they have. And then a facilitator can open the floor to address kind of the root of those, of those feelings. Anything to add there? Mm, no, I think I, the only thing I would mention is that oftentimes there are underlying feelings, <laughs> whether it's fear or um, you know something else that is driving someone to take a position and, and sometimes taking a moment to try to unearth what the underlying emotion might be that's driving that position can be helpful. And that's where I think the gradients of agreement tool can be really useful is that you can um, understand, you know, maybe there's one little piece of a proposal that is someone, you know, can't get behind um, and you never would have guessed <laughs> why or what that is. And so um, just by giving people a different a uh, set of language and some different words to talk about where they fall on a proposal. Um, you know, everyone's truth, everyone comes to a decision with sort of a different truth. Um, so that I think is part of the part of the dynamic as well. So I would encourage folks to um, write their questions in the Q&A if you still have some. Um, I have another one here. So uh, just asking for some clarification around the use of executive decision, that executive sessions, um, which might leave a decision to a subgroup. And I'll, I'll say a couple words about executive sessions and then um, Kelly, welcome your additional comments on the topic. So executive sessions, for those who aren't familiar with them, um, are typically sessions where um, uh, some subset is invited to stay and others are, are asked to leave. And so um, it could be, you know, the general manager and the board, you know, maybe you have some guests from um, some members who are attending. And um, so you ask those members to leave and you go into executive session. In that case, you might be talking about an HR matter, um, a legal matter, or, you know, property, real estate. So when I was on the Willie Street Grocery Co-op board, um, when we were talking about real estate matters related to um, an expansion, um, that the, the executive session group was the manager um, and the board. There are other scenarios where an executive session is, is truly referring to just the board members. And um, I think that executive sessions uh, are a really great tool to implement regularly as a board. Um, so at the end of every meeting, you go into executive session, and um, maybe you don't have anything to talk about. Maybe you just say, oh, that was a great meeting. Um, you know, anyone have anything to share? And nope, nope, you know, and then you close it and that's the end. Um, but what regular executive sessions do is they provide space and time for the board to talk about things that they might not feel comfortable talking about in front of the manager. Um, to, you know, there might be some little frustration that if not actually discussed by the group sort of festers and creates some conflict that could be easily avoided by having a conversation as a group. Um, so executive sessions are not intended to be like the place where you air all your grievances, um, but they, they are, and so by having them regularly, um, you don't, they don't send up a red flag when the board decides to have one. So. I've worked with boards that never have executive sessions. Suddenly they have an issue maybe with the manager or with something else where the board just wants to meet itself. It's never done that before. And so um, the fact that it is asking for an executive session causes the manager to really be concerned. Like, oh gosh, what's going on? Um, so the nice thing about doing them regularly is that it's just, it's normalized. Um, and a, a key piece for executive sessions then is, you know, if you are having them, Typically, decisions are not made in executive session. Um, and, you know, you might be making a decision related to real estate or legal matters, 
Um, but if it's the board, of course, the board can decide things um, if it wants to in executive session. But often what I encourage groups to do, boards to do, is to have a, a sort of a closed loop back to the general manager or the CEO where um, that board chair afterwards loops back to the CEO and GM and just sort of gives them a sense of what was discussed in the executive session, um, just so that there, you know, there isn't cause for concern or worry um, that, you know, you're trying to avoid that for the GM. So I think they're a great tool. Um, I think they're really used. They can be a nice place too for the board to reflect on um, what went well in the meeting, what could have been better although you can do that in the regular agenda as well. So Kelly, anything to add on executive sessions? Not specifically, um, but one thing related. So um, a year ago when we first started doing these webinars um, virtually, um, Courtney presented on tools for an effective board. Um, and a portion of that, if that is web recording is available for free on our website. Um, and a portion of that is about agenda setting. And so I think that having always listing an executive session uh, at the end of the agenda, again, whether you utilize it um, or not or for a few minutes or for something more substantive um, is really a great idea, right? To just have that, have it always there, have that consistency. Um, Another thing that is addressed in that webinar that uh, is re certainly related to today is that um, to think about um, if you're the director, the sorry, the board chair or facilitator, someone who's putting together the agenda, to think through most of the time um, in our agendas, we just list topics and maybe we have time um, allocated to those topics. In that webinar um, on our website, um, we refer to a certain type of agenda that includes space for the process. And so this forces you to think for a few minutes ahead of time, this, you know, this particular agenda item, I want to make sure we, we give some time for quiet reflection, or this is going to be a big complicated decision, or, you know, we have two or three proposals to compare, we're going to do a criteria matrix. And then when people receive the agenda, they are prepared not only for what the topically what's going to happen, but what the processes are that will be used, and it won't be a surprise to them once these are once these processes um, are introduced in general. So I, I recommend if you're thinking about trying out some of these processes that they that somehow a note gets made about them on your agenda that that will be part of what happens. Thanks, Kelly. So we have another question. Um, any suggestions for a facilitator to encourage those who may be reserved to talk um, to share their view on an issue? I think that this is where that that quiet reflection um, moment, you know, can be really valuable, right? So that people have time to gather their thoughts, um, <clears throat> maybe write something down. And even if, and then if you follow it up with the, the round robin share, right? Maybe they speak for a very short period of time, right? They, maybe they read what was written on their paper um, from their reflection. But that, you know, that round robin after, after thinking, I think oftentimes gives the space. It, it kind of, it lowers the, the pressure of having to be fast with your words and fast with your thoughts. Um, and I think sometimes it just feel, it creates a bit more openness for people to feel like even though they're quiet or you know, hesitant that they have, they have space. I would say the gradients of agreement is another way that you can give you know, everyone an opportunity to weigh in. They may not be providing direct, you know, like they might not be providing comments on a specific issue, but even allowing them the ability to provide a more nuanced <laughs> reaction to a proposal rather than just an up-down vote where everyone's voting and you're sort of, your yay or nay gets kind of lost in the crowd, um, that that's another sort of subtle way to um, spread out participation across the board. I think too, another thing, you know, if you're a board chair and you have a couple people on your board who seem really hesitant to participate, 
um, it can't hurt as a board chair to just have a conversation with them offline, you know? So, um, you know, as board chair, it's often a good practice, you know, to occasionally have coffee or lunch or a Zoom date now um, with people on the board just to get a sense of how they're doing. And um, so it's an opportunity to say, hey, you know, I've noticed that um, sometimes you're kind of quiet in the boardroom. Um, I just want to make sure you feel like your voice can be heard. You know, are there things I can do as the chair um, to help you participate more um, because I really value your input. So um, there's another question that I'm not quite understanding. Any resources for, if you want to if you want to type in the second half of your question, I'm happy to happy to pitch it to Kelly. Um, while we're waiting on that, um, another question here about <laughs> I think this is a funny question: how to know the best decision? How to know the best decision to make when dealing with a conflict between two parties where either side is very stubborn? <laughs> so, Kelly, any advice for um, a situation maybe where people are digging in their heels, or it just feels like they're um, you know, maybe not open to listening to another perspective. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think this is where <clears throat> pulling it, pulling it away from the people <laughs> as much as possible, right? So this is, this is where I think there could be a really interesting use of think, pair, share. So again, you know, unless you've got all the, all the Zoom skills, this is you know, a lot easier when you're in person. But pairing people up in the boardroom who, who maybe don't usually talk to each other, who aren't always on the same side. And in that, that moment of, of pairing, just the two of them talking, um, they're, they're not, you know, there's not a vote happening. They're not speaking to the whole group, right? It can be just an opportunity for, you know, okay, let me just hear you and I'll, I'll say my piece and then, then we'll get to the bigger group, right? So it, it takes the, the, two, the two sides away from, from the big group. So that can be a, a reason to use the think pair share. I think um, any, any sort of, any way that you can use to put the context or impact of the decision in the context of the co-op as opposed to the people who feel one way or the other about the decision. So this goes back to using maybe something like a criteria matrix, you know, so do, you know, which of these ideas um, it's going to take, you know, how much time are these ideas going to take? How much are they going to cost in relation to each other? Um, how much do they align with um, our you know, priorities for the year, how much do they align with our mission statement, right? And so um, those, those things kind of, um, they help depersonalize. Um, and those are things you could get people to rank those things anonymously too, right? Um, I think the, the blind voting and, and getting people to, to kind of share things anonymously is maybe an underutilized, take, maybe takes a little bit more time and effort, but I really think it can help break up that dynamic where you just have loud voices, you know, from different sides um, kind of facing off with each other. <laughs> I think too, not to go back to gradients of agreement like every time there's a question, but um, it is a really powerful tool. I think too, sometimes we think people are stubborn because we've created a black and white environment where they either have to 100, you know, vote yes for something or vote no for something. And that gradients of agreement and when used um, skillfully and, um, you know, having follow-up questions that sort of, you know, what could help you, you know, I see that you are, have some concerns about this proposal, um, as opposed to trying to convince the person who is not supportive of the proposal to see it your way, really trying to understand what they might need um, in order to get on board with the proposal. And so sometimes things that can appear to be stubbornness, part of the, part of the problem is the dynamic that we've set up of, you know, you're either for it or against it. Um, and when we change that paradigm so that we're trying to understand maybe what specific pieces of a proposal might make someone uncomfortable, um, that also eliminates that like for, against, you're stubborn, why can't you, you know, um, in a way that can be really helpful. 
All right, another question. So how does a facilitator, sort of the flip side of one of the previous questions, how does a facilitator deal with members who speak too much? Um, sometimes they provide really pertinent information and reflections, but sometimes those members are not helpful. Um, I mean, this is where um, round robin, a lot of use of round robin can be really helpful. Um, with a lot really, you know, allotted time periods for um, sharing the, dis, you know, discussion or what or, or other process on, on a topic. Um, again, I, I think that some people, um, some people are verbal thinkers, right? So they, maybe their thoughts come to them quickly, but they're like processing out loud and part, so part of the the, the airtime that they're taking up is their external processing. I'm not, no judgment, right? The ever, we all do, we all think differently, right? Some of our thinking is quiet, some of it's out loud. And so I think that, so something like a, a quiet moment of reflection, I think can force people to, to do that quietly and to, and to organize their thoughts um, before and maybe condense them before sharing out loud. Um, but that, that round robin, you know, it only gives them a certain amount of time, right? So it's like they have to get their thoughts organized and then everyone goes around. Um, and, and it's not to say you couldn't come around again, right? But it's about, it's about kind of keeping the conversation moving around the, the circle, around the table or around the, the Zoom squares um, without that, that voice dominating. I think another, um, Kelly referred to a previous webinar where we talked about meeting agendas and outcomes on meeting agendas. I think sometimes it can feel if you're a chair or the facilitator, like you're being rude by you know, cutting someone off. <laughs> um, and um, what I've discovered is that often there are others in the room that appreciate when um, the chair or the facilitator really takes that role seriously. Um, and, and your role as a facilitator is to make sure all voices are heard. You're facilitating the decision-making process. And so two things, one, um, I encourage you as a chair facilitator to potentially step in and say, um, you know, that's great. Like this is helpful for us processing. Um, you know, the outcome of this agenda item is really this, um, you know, so like, let's make sure we're focusing our conversation on achieving that outcome. So the agenda then becomes can potentially become a tool as well for the facilitator to, um, you know, refocus the conversation if there's someone who seems to pull it away. Um, another thing that I've done is, and I don't, you know, is sort of subtle and sort of not is, you know, if it seems like a couple people are dominating the conversation, I'll say, you know, I'd really love to hear from someone who hasn't shared any thoughts yet. And um, hopefully <laughs> that's kind of a signal that like, let's, um, let's let some other voices be heard here. So a couple more questions. I also like using share pair to help those folks get talking done a little bit too. Yep, that's a great, um, thank you, Annie. Um, the, you know, sometimes for those of us who are verbal processors that think pair share can help us. Um, we get the processing done during the, um, the pairing and um, then we'll, when we're with the full group, um, the, the comments can be a little bit more focused. Um, another, any resources for how a board can learn about the power and importance of interpersonal relationships, Kellen? We've got about another minute, so quick answer, so, and then we'll close um, things up. I don't know. The short answer, Courtney and I took a 10-day course <laughs> on facilitation where we learned about a lot of these strategies. We facilitate, the, it's really an art. There are, there are, you know, tools you can use a little bit like a recipe, but um, I think yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's a link going to be a link to this this manual in the follow up email. This is a lot of the stuff we've talked about today comes from here. You know, yeah, it's like a little bit thick, um, but it's very practical um, <laughs> for all the relationships and groups you work with in your life, not just your co op board. Um, that's a that's a resource. You know, maybe we could bring it to the GM, point out a couple things to the to the board that might be worth trying. Yeah. Um, that, that's my one comment there. <laughs> yeah, um, it's the kind of kind of work that um, can be useful to do in a board retreat or something too, I think. Um, 
some of that interpersonal work and helping people understand the importance of communication. I've done some trainings for boards on communication um, and culture that um, at least start those conversations. So we are at time. So I'm going to share my screen here again for the final. Let's see if I'll do this. Do, do, do. Hmm. Great. So um, thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you so much, everyone who joined us for your questions um, and for participating. Just quickly, this is our co-op development team here at the center. So um, if you have questions about cooperative governance, about how to start a new co-op, um, anything related to co-ops, please don't hesitate to reach out to one of us. Um, and then lastly, just thank you again. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, and we look forward, hopefully, um, to being in person with you again soon. So wishing you all a wonderful rest of your day. Take good care.